Hi everybody and welcome to your summary video from our Keep Well session. This past month we looked at a leader's influence on well-being. When we started into the session I showed you this photograph here of our employees doing our exercise class. Now I made the point that I've worked with organizations where the leaders really encourage individuals to go and use the facilities, the exercise classes, and there's no doubt that this makes a big impact on the culture. But conversely, I've also worked within organizations where the culture really worked against employees taking advantage of those services. It was nearly looked down upon if you left your desk to obviously go and do an exercise class. And we made the point that there's no doubt if you invest, as an example, into a fantastic exercise facility on site, but your culture is against encouraging people to take advantage of that, there's no doubt that leaders play a big role in that and you'll find yourself having wasted a lot of the investment into that facility. So that's just one example where we see leaders influencing well-being. But today, what we really want to focus on is to show you how we can upscale our leaders to really build a positive culture around well-being. If we think about what well-being looks like from a macro environment, this for me captures it quite well. We can see there is the element of the influence of the manager or leader in here. We're looking at things like energizing environments, etc. If we brought that more to a micro level, we see here what individuals that we come in contact with within our organizations may be dealing with on a day to day basis. And as we can see, we have our physical, our intellectual, our emotional and our social. And there's no doubt that our work context, whether it's within our team, whether it's our direct contact with our manager or our leader, all of these can either be helped or hindered by those interactions. And I think it's important for us to be mindful of that. If we consider for a moment how we might measure the different aspects of well-being within the workplace, one that we have is our hedonic well-being. And this is normally measured when we think of our job satisfaction. The second and one that we're going to look at in more detail today is what we call our eudaimonic well-being. And this is normally measured by work engagement scores. There's two others that are important to mention here. We obviously have our negative well-being, which, for example, might be aspects like maybe emotional exhaustion or incidents of burnout within our organization. And then we also have our physical well-being. This would be aspects like energy levels or even sleep quality of employees. And it's important to be mindful of all of these four areas. But what we want to look at today is that aspect of eudaimonic well-being and the role that leaders play when we consider that. So if we see here, we've got what we call our circumplex of well-being. And for many of you listening in, you might feel that getting people to a point where they're satisfied within their job is enough. But actually, what we want to do and what we must strive for within organizations is to obviously avoid the lower left quadrant. We don't want people to be burnt out, but we want to encourage people towards that work engagement space. And we, if we look very briefly at work engagement and ultimately what it's characterized by, we see vigor, dedication and absorption. And the role that a leader plays here is being mindful, for example, that when I have an individual who is engaged in their work, I'm making sure that that absorption doesn't push that individual potentially to high stress and potential burnout. And we're going to look at how a leader facilitates work engagement in more detail next. So before we look at the elements of work engagement and the role that leaders play, very quickly, here's just a couple of stats around the area of work engagement. So there's no doubt that there is room for improvement in this area. If we think about eudaimonic well-being, here's a definition of eudaimonic well-being, as well as looking at key aspects and examples of eudaimonic well-being. Now, as you're reading through those different examples, I'm sure that you can think about times where you've encountered a manager or a leader who was very good at, for example, giving you autonomy, 
helping you attach maybe the role that work plays in the wider scope of your life and giving work purpose for you within your life. So we start to piece together this role that a leader plays when they understand eudaimonic well-being and they can really facilitate it within their teams. If we look at ultimately what underpins eudaimonic well-being, it's our self-determination theory. These are the three universal needs that we all crave. As we can see, autonomy, competence and relatedness. And again, you can see that a, a leader who is aware of these can help facilitate them for individuals. And this is the key, not only to increases in eudaimonic well-being, but this also underpins our intrinsic motivation. But I want to stop for a moment and just let's put the emphasis back on the leader for a second. Here's just a little photograph that I've added in here. And for me, in a way, this can sometimes epitomize the leader. They're heading out. They don't know when and if the weather is going to change. They could be facing that stormy weather. They set into the day and they have their plan. And before they know it, things can go awry. A good way to capture this in a model is the model that we see here, which is from Pendleton. And it looks at three key domains for a leader. We have our strategic, our operational, and our interpersonal. And these are all equally weighted. But I don't need to uh, tell you which one gets neglected as leaders' demands increase and their resources start to decrease. We start to neglect the interpersonal domain. Now, as I've said, these are all equally weighted. So if we neglect that domain, we eventually will find the well-being and the performance of our teams will start to drop. So if we look at ultimately why this is, a great model to really explain this is our job demands resources model, which you will see here. And ultimately, our goal is to increase the personal and job resources of our leaders so that they can then increase the personal and job resources of our team members, our employees. So things and factors that obviously play here are leadership style. Have we got autocratic leaders or transformational leaders, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But as you can see, one of them basically triggers a motivational process and the other triggers a health impairment process, which leads to burnout. So if we look very briefly at some of those personal resources, we can see things like self-efficacy. So that's the confidence you have within your role. Again, if I'm a leader who gives regular feedback, regular recognition to my team, I'm helping my team members increase that level of self-efficacy. If we look at some of the job demands and job resources, again, just very briefly, you'll be able to see the role the leader plays here. So obviously job demands like role ambiguity. If I'm not very clear with individuals in my team or I don't see the importance of making their roles clear, obviously their day-to-day -day responsibilities and tasks, that increases the demands for team members. And then obviously, conversely, we can see some of the job resources. One that stands out to me is having leaders and managers that are good coaches, that are good mentors. And when we get this balance right, again, we're moving people towards work engagement. So just very quickly, let's look at those transformational leadership skills. They're known as the four eyes. And this is what we want to promote our leaders to move towards, to really represent. But probably the biggest difficulty leaders find is exactly this. It's OK, I just need to be more transformational, but actually, in a lot of cases, we're not told maybe what individual consideration is or how to create inspirational motivation. These are just things that we expect leaders to be able to do. Well, guess what? Leaders need training and development in these areas. What we're going to look at next is a brief case study where we focused on increasing leaders' transformational skills. So to finish off our summary video, I'd like to introduce a short case study to you, but also show you ultimately some of the key aspects we focus on in our leadership development programs. 
So as you can see here, this is a model that we work with within Fit Vision. It considers the individual, the team, and the environment. And what we've done here is we've identified key skills in each of those areas that if we can ultimately increase in our leaders, we know that they're going to promote more sustainable well-being and performance. And you see there very briefly from an individual perspective, we might focus on something like physical well-being. From a team perspective, we make sure leaders have good coaching skills. And from an environment perspective, we will look at things like psychological safety being key. What I'd like to do is just show you an example of how we bring this together and how we did it for a current client. So in terms of where we start, we look at a needs analysis with all of those key nine areas with leadership. And obviously you can do the same as well. This obviously helped us to identify the areas in which the leaders needed to maybe focus, the areas of opportunity, but it also was able to uncover the areas of strength for that leadership group. So we have an aggregated score and we have an individual score as a result of this. You'll also see that we supported the leaders with one-to-one -one coaching. We held facilitated group sessions where ultimately individuals could get to know each other on a deeper level, could obviously share knowledge and wisdom as part of those group sessions. And then we support all of this in terms of providing resources to those leaders. Next, if we think about what did we want to achieve, I'll bring you briefly back to our job demands resources model. We want to increase leaders' personal and job resources so they can deal with the inevitable increase in their demands. So that's where our nine key skills really come into play because what we're looking at here are resources for leaders. And then the final piece, the final measurement or what we want to achieve, it's looking at your internal ways of measuring things like people leader effectiveness and overall engagement. So we weave in some of your internal measurements as part of our own program as well. And generally what we find is across those quantitative and qualitative bits of measurement, we see great strides made by leaders. If we were to very much wrap up our short summary video and there was three takeaways for you, I would say the first one is we've got to make sure that leaders are making well-being an explicit value. The second piece is we need to give leaders to time to understand well-being and its trade-offs. And the last piece is really empowering leaders to showcase those role modeling behaviors. And that can only be done when we give them time to take a step back and reflect. Thank you.